Hello and welcome to A DM's Guide to Tomb of Annihilation. This is episode 22, and in today's episode, we're going to look at the Millery Sphere. And this is the last room of level 5, and on the next episode, we're going to the final level, level 6 of the Tomb of the Nine Gods. And guys, if you do enjoy this content, remember to like and subscribe, and if you're feeling generous, there's a Patreon link in the description below. So let's jump right in. What is the Millery Sphere? 70. A Millery Sphere. This chamber contains a bronze apparatus centered on a hinged arm. Slowly rotating within the arm is a 10 foot diameter globe decorated by a topographic map of landforms and oceans. Concentric rings of brass constrain the device, all rotating and bearing their own lesser spheres. One of these spheres has sharp points and appears sun-like. Carvings of tall headless humanoids decorate the walls of this room. So in this room you have this giant bronze sphere. Best way to describe it is this is a giant globe that swings open and it allows you to see a seat inside. So one thing you need to really specify here is on these walls you can see there's headless humanoids. And that is a clue to the villain in this room, which is a Nagaloth right here. And he has a magical axe that if he rolls a critical hit, he will decapitate your characters. And if your characters need a head to survive, they will die, unless they're immune to slashing damage. So this character here has a 1 in 20 chance of killing your character out right in the head. So let's discuss how you release this villain and how can this armillary sphere really, really change your campaign completely. So let's go in more detail about it. So if your characters walk within 5 feet of this sphere, the apparatus swings around, his rings rotating out of the way as the surface of the globe peaks back to reveal a dark hollow interior. Inside this cavity is a padded bronze chair with levers built into the armrests. So as your characters come within 5 feet of this device, it'll open up and it'll show you this seat. If you set the seat inside, this will shut and this will seal your characters inside. If you try to block the door in any way, it's going to cause sparks of electricity to fire out at your characters. Until the blockage is removed, any creature within 5 feet of the military sphere that isn't seated in the chair takes 48 lightning damage. When your character sits alone in the chair inside, the sphere is going to close, sealing them inside. And as the globe is sealed, the character sitting in this chair can see through the globe as it's made of transparent glass. If it pulls any of the levers on the armrests, it can control these brass rings that will orientate the different spheres outside. And if they do that, they're going to release the monster in the moon, which is this Nagaloth that I explained for. Cramped inside this bronze orb representing Toral's moon saloon, this Nagaloth will be released the first time any character tries to orientate these spheres. Then the Nagaloth is going to try to kill all creatures that are outside of the sphere. And he's not going to attack the person sitting in the seat inside. However, as soon as they release themselves, he's going to hunt them down. And as I said before, if he rolls a natural 20 attack roll with his great attacks, it will decapitate any character it hits. Unless the character is immune to slashing damage, can survive without a head, or has legendary actions. And even if that is the case, it will still take the weapon's damage. So let's look more at this Nakaloth and what he's going to do in combat. In the monster manual it says that Nakaloths are the elite airborne shark troops of the Yugloths. They look like muscular gargoyles, powerful batwings that bear them swiftly off in battle. They have razor sharp claws for their hands and they can cut through flesh and bone with ease. They have the ability to teleport and they have innate magical abilities to turn invisible or create illusionary doubles. The main thing to look at is they are the most loyal of Yugoroths and they will only betray their master if their reward is massive and extreme. So the stats of the Lugaloth is it has an armor class of 18, which is quite high. It has a lot of hit points of 123. But the main thing you want to notice is that it can fly 60 feet in a turn. And with its action, if you attack once on a turn, you can still teleport before or after attack. So he will chase down characters who flee. So unless your characters can run 120 feet in a turn, they won't be able to outrun this creature. It's immune to acid and poison damage. It has resistance to cold, fire, lightning, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magical attacks. It has a high rating for stealth, but because it's bursting out of this moon, I don't think you need to worry about that. But for me personally, bursting out of this moon, if anyone is outside of the similarity sphere, I would definitely give this creature a surprise round. His ability to cast darkness, detect magic, dispel magic, invisibility, and mirror image. It has magical resistance, meaning it has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. 
and all of this creature's attacks are magical. So if I was playing this in combat, what it'll do is it'll have a surprise turn and it will make two melee attacks. Typically when you're doing this, you'd use a claw attack, but because he has a magical axe that can cause decapitation, and this room has motives on the wall showing headless creatures walking, he's definitely going to use his magical great axe. So it's a plus nine to hit, and it will do 2d12 plus five slashing damage. But he's not trying to kill them with damage. This Nugoloth is trying to decapitate your player characters. So he'll do that twice in a turn, so he'll make two great axe attacks. Then if he reaches a character, he's basically going to teleport and he's going to catch up and he's going to repeat over and over again. So when my players end up in this encounter, what happened was the rogue came through here in stealth. He sat within the sphere by himself. He started playing with all these different levers and this caused the fear to shut. This released Nakaloth, who wasn't going to target him. However, he's the only one in this room. He cast a message to his other colleagues to help him get out of this fear without being attacked by this head on. So the whole party prepared and they fired spells at a distance. And very luckily, this Nagaloth rolled two 19s in this combat, but he did not successfully decapitate any of the player characters. So in your game, if anyone did get decapitated, let me know in the comments below. After your characters defeat this monster, which is a very, very deadly encounter, it doesn't matter how spec top your characters are, if he rolls a 20, they're dead, and that's the end of their character. So one last thing to mention, this Nagaloth has this weapon that can cause decapitation and a critical hit. There's been a lot of discussion in the forums and online about this, and some people end up giving their characters a Vorpal Grey Axe. From the way I read the book, I state that the creature itself is magical and it's the creature and a Serax power that's causing this attack, not the weapon itself. However, if you really do want to give your characters a Vorpal weapon, that is up to you. But that is one thing to watch out for. The way I would rule this is that the weapon is not magical and it's just a standard large Grey Axe. But I'm very curious to see how you found this out in your games. So let's say that your character survived this. What else can their Millery Sphere do? So it has this ability called Critical Conjunction. If your player character sits in this chair and he has time, or he or she has time, they can control all the different celestial bodies outside of the sphere. And you don't have to do any check with this. You can just say, hey, you have moon, you have asteroids, you have various spheres outside, and you have the ability to control them. You can ask your characters what they do. And over time, if they do put them in a straight line, an effect will occur. These effects can be rather minor or they could be completely game changing. So you roll a D100. If it's a 1 to 5, the Millery Sphere and any creature inside will disappear. And as DM, you can choose where they go. Do they end up in Mechanus, Vast Swamp of Orth, Mount Nevermind on Krynth, the Desert of Atlas, or perhaps even Victorian London on Earth? or even the sun if you want to be really nasty. So that there can, if you wish, can just take that character of the campaign forever. The next one is from 6 to 15. The character sitting in this humility chair is touched by an unknown entity and suffers a radical personality change. This is a bit easier to handle because you can take your character aside and have a brief discussion like, hey, who do you see? And you can build up some character creation there. The only thing with this is it happens near the end of the campaign so your characters won't be able to role play this for a long period of time because you only have maybe three or four sessions at tops before this campaign finishes. However, if you want to play a campaign past level 12, this could be a very, very good situation to be in. It will give your characters more depth. We get 16 to 30, Cloud Kill spell is cast within the globe. And after this effect takes place, your character will be trapped in here. It's a locked hatch, it's a large object, has an AC of 11, 25 hit points, is immune to poison and psychic damage. And as long as you stop moving the outer rings and the, the orbs, you can move this hatch open with a successful DC 20 at Celestix check. Or if you're proficient in Thieves tools, you can do a DC 20 dexterity check. Otherwise, your character will be stuck in here and they'll slowly die to poison damage. 31 to 50, the sun-shaped orb splits open, showing 5,000 gold pieces, which is a nice boon for your character. 51 to 65, the creature sitting in their Melia chair gains a charm of heroism. All that a charm of heroism is, is that as an action, you can drink a potion of heroism. For one hour after drinking it, you gain 10 temporary hit points that last for one hour. For the same duration, you are also under the effect of a blessed spell with no concentration required. This is a benefit, however, I'd rather take the 5,000 gold pieces. 
From 66 to 80, every creature within 20 feet of the Millery Sphere regains 50 hit points. Creatures inside the globe do not gain this benefit. From 81 to 90, a gem of brightness appears in the lap of a creature sitting inside their Millery Sphere. So I quite like the gem of brightness. This prism has 50 charges. While holding it, you can use an action to speak one of three command words to cause one of the following effects. The first command word causes the gem to shine bright in 30 foot radius in dim light for another 30 feet. This effect doesn't expend a charge. It will last until you use a bonus action to repeat the command word or until you use another function of this gem. The second command word expends one charge and causes the gem to fire a brilliant beam of light at one creature you can see within 60 feet of you. They must exceed the DC 15 concentrating saving throw or become blinded for one minute. And they can repeat the same throughout the end of each of their turns. The third command word expends five charges and causes the gem to flare with blinding light in the 30 foot cone originating from it. Each creature in the cone must make a saving throw that is stuck by the beam created by the second command word. So this gem allows you to blind people. And with a 30 foot cone, you can blind a whole platoon potentially. And once you use your 50 charges, you can then sell it for 50 gold pieces. And now for the last two abilities for. This is when things get really, really interesting. If you get 91 to 99, your intelligence score permanently increases by 1d4 plus 1. So you could increase your intelligence score by 5 up to a maximum of 22, which is a very, very big plus, especially if you are a wizard. Intelligence is your spellcasting modifier. And if you do get 100, you gain the ability to use the wish spell once, and this is completely game-changing. And just before I forget, there is a secret crawlway that allows you to go back to Area 61. So guys, that is the final room of level 5, and the next episode we're going to go down into level 6, and we're going to discuss the last floor for the Tomb of Annihilation. Again, thank you very much for watching, and just before I forget, has this room caused any major upsets for your game? As in, did anyone get teleported to another plane of existence? Did any of your characters end up with 5,000 gold pieces? Did they end up in Victoria or London? And guys, if you do enjoy this content, remember to like and subscribe, and if you're feeling generous, there's a Patreon link in the description below. And I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.